Good afternoon and welcome to our 2021 elections forum. I'm Tracy McCluskey, Director of Meetings and Special Events. We are going to get started and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome the chair of our election procedures committee and the moderator of today's program, Honorable Michael Snyder. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Good afternoon, everybody. It is my pleasure and honor to be able to be the moderator of today's elections forum. This is the second of the forums that are being produced and sponsored by the association. The first forum uh, which occurred last week was one which was uh, co-sponsored by the Diversity and Profession Committee. For those who missed that forum, there is an opportunity for you to be able to view the recording of that forum. Today's forum will be one in which you will have an opportunity to hear questions uh, and presentations by the candidates for vice chancellor uh, and the candidates for board of governors. Uh, in addition, those who are running uh, for office who are uncontested will have an opportunity to introduce themselves. There will be one final forum on Friday that will be designed to be exclusively for uh, the Young Lawyers Division Executive Committee, and that will be presented by the YLD uh, to, to determine that at that time. So you can find the link to the video of the previous forum along with the Bar Association's guide uh, if you look down at the chat function. Uh, the procedure today will be as follows. I am first going to introduce each of the individuals who are in unopposed officer positions to allow them to introduce themselves briefly and to indicate the position that they are going to be holding. So uh, without further ado, at this point, uh, will the following individuals who are unopposed officer candidates, please turn on uh, your cameras, uh, but keep your microphone muted unless you're speaking. And that would be Michael Stackow, Diane Penny Zettelman, Matt Olish and Dino Privatera. And I'm going to start with Michael Stackow, who is unopposed for the position of secretary. Thank you, Judge Snyder. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Stackow. I'm counsel at uh, Cozen O'Connor, and uh, I am running for secretary, a uh, position I currently hold. Thank you all. Thank you, Mike. Next, I'd like to move to Assistant Secretary Diane Penny Settlement. Hi, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, I teach at Villanova Law School, and I'm a member of the Board of Governors and a co-chair of the International Law and Committee on uh, Academic Engagement Committees, and I'm running for Assistant Secretary. Thank you, Diane. Uh, next, I will move to Treasurer Matt Olish. Thank you, Judge. Hey, everyone. How are you? Um, Matt Olish here. I'm a partner at Obermeyer, business law attorney here. A commercial litigator, and I am running for treasurer. Thank you, Matt. And finally, uh, Assistant Treasurer Dina Privatera. Thank you, Judge Snyder, and thank you, Tracy, for organizing this. You do a great job every time. Uh, my name is Dino Privatera. I am a solo practitioner in my own practice. The Privatera. I do predominantly personal injury work. I am running unopposed for the assistant treasurer position, and I want to wish everybody the best of luck. All the candidates uh, that are involved, all are excellent candidates, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. So at this point, will all of those who are in that position of being unopposed officer candidates, please turn off your cameras and mute your microphones. Next, we will have uh, the individuals who are running for the Board of Governors candidates. Each individual will be given one and a half minutes to introduce themselves and to share why they are running for a seat on the Board of Governors. Uh, candidates will be informed when they have 15 seconds left before the end of their term uh, in order to be able to wrap up what they are saying. So at this time, with the following individuals, please turn on your cameras, keep your microphone muted unless you are speaking. Will Braveman, Ernie Holzheimer, Michael Huff, Stephen Culp, Bethany Nikitenko, Nan Sato, and Arlie Smith Pearson. Okay. And we will begin in alphabetical order with Will Braveman. Will, if you would, please. 
Thank you, Judge. I'm excited to be considered amongst a very distinguished field of people who are running for this. I was born and raised in Philadelphia, went to Temple Law. I live in Bella Vista with my wife and family. I was a city solicitor and assistant and a deputy for 12 different years in three different units. First, the child welfare and mental health unit, and then in the labor and employment units. Thereafter, I went to a small firm and did union side employee work. And presently I'm designated for about 2,400 city of Philadelphia employees and supervisors across the agency, including DC 33 local 696. Labor and employment law is about 75% of my practice. I also defend mental health patients four days a month at Friends. And uh, my volunteer work is something that I've always been very proud of. I've been an FJG pro bono award recipient every year of my practice. And my family and I volunteer every year on MLK Day. You can check out my website for the rest of my details. I've been active in the Bar Association throughout. I'm now on the LRIS panel and I'm a committee member for the LRIS. Uh, and I really appreciate this opportunity to speak to everyone. I wish everyone the best of luck. Stay safe. Thank you, Will. Next, Ernie Holzheimer. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Ernie Holzheimer. Um, I, as of yesterday, I am a member in the corporate and securities group here at Eckert Siemens. Um, I started my legal career at Montgomery McCracken Walker and Rhodes, where I grew from a summer associate all the way through the partnership. Um, in their corporate and securities group as well. I grew up just across the bridge in Southern New Jersey and now live with my wife in Grad Hospital. Uh, we've lived in Philadelphia for the past five years. Um, prior to that, I commuted for, for law school at Drexel University. Um, currently have the honor of serving as the chair of the business law section this year and also as an appointed member to the Board of Governors. I'm very proud of all the work that we've done both in the business law section and on the Board of Governors this year. We pass a lot of meaningful resolutions on the Board of Governors. The business law section has uh, pivoted throughout the pandemic and has been able to engage and grow our membership uh, throughout the year, holding various events and um, CLE programs. Um, I, as a first generation attorney, I got involved in the Bar Association while a law student and um, they haven't been able to get rid of me since. Um, I grew through the Young Lawyers Division, uh, was elected to the Executive Committee of the Young, Young Lawyers Division, served as Treasurer and then Vice Chair prior to ending my tenure um, with the Young Lawyers Division, and really look forward to continuing my involvement with the association and the membership. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ernie. Uh, next, um, Michael Huff. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Huff. I'm excited and honored to be running for the Board of Governors of the oldest bar association in the United States. And I wanna thank everybody for this opportunity uh, to speak with you today. I'll tell you a little bit about myself, my practice and why I'm running for the Board of Governors. Uh, my wife and I have been married for over 20 years. Uh, we have three children. Uh, we have a daughter who is a sophomore in college and twin sons who are seniors in high school. Uh, my wife works for a nonprofit in the city advocating for fair funding for public schools, as well as pre-K for PA students. I have been self-employed as a criminal uh, defense attorney for the past 27 years. That includes state and federal court in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, and the reason why I'm running for the Board of Governors is about six years ago, I experienced a strong sense of urgency uh, to get involved and to try to make a difference in my community. And a lot of that had to do with the political landscape uh, that was going on at the time and unfortunately continues with us today. I realized that democracy is not a spectator sport, that it's incredibly fragile. And if we don't get involved in our communities, uh, then we're not gonna have a chance to make a brighter future, not only for our country, but uh, for our children in our community. So I jumped in with uh, both feet. I got involved in electoral politics, um, canvassing for state, uh, local and national um, candidates, uh, knocking on people's doors, speaking to them about issues that are important to them, encouraging them to vote and doing voter registration. I was also involved in uh, community service during COVID, delivering meals to people throughout the city who were experiencing uh, food insecurity. I participate in uh, beautifying our parks. This past Saturday, I cleaned uh, you, Vernon Park. I'm sorry, I'll just say that I, want to bring my energy enthusiasm to the Bar Association. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Sorry. Uh, next, I'd like to call on Stephen Culp, please. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Culp. I use he, him pronouns, and it's a privilege to be here speaking with all the attendees and also um, running against a qualified slate of candidates for Board of Governors. Um, I originally was born in South Korea, but moved to Philadelphia um, and have been here uh, my entire life. I, I went to Drexel undergrad, uh, Drexel Law School, and I've been pretty much at my uh, small defense firm here in Philadelphia for the past almost eight years. Um, I believe that I am a qualified candidate um, for the Board of Governors who will bring a voice to a table that is necessary uh, in order to further and um, demonstrate the commitment of the Philadelphia Bar Association to resolutions passed regarding um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I am a, I'm currently the chair of the Philadelphia LGBTQ Bar Association, which is an affinity of the Philadelphia Bar. And I believe that my uh, background in, in bar uh, and board leadership um, will make me a uh, true leader and um, uh, someone who commits to service to all members of the Philadelphia Bar Association. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next, Bethany Nikitenko, please. Good afternoon. My name is Bethany Nikitenko, and I'm a partner with Feldman Shepard. I'm a trial attorney who represents catastrophically injured clients. I'm currently serving a one-year appointed term to the Board of Governors. I'm also the vice chair of the YLD. This year, I also had the privilege of serving on the bench bar committee. I've also served as a mentor through the Bar Association for several years. For my commitment to pro bono work, I was bestowed the Craig M. Perry Service Award by the YLD in 2018. I would like the opportunity to continue serving both the legal community and the broader Philadelphia community through service to the Bar Association. Through the Board of Governors, I would like to continue to develop programming to foster legal, education, professional development, and wellness. It is my intention to focus these efforts on new attorneys entering the legal profession and on women who incurred all hurdles both in staying in and excelling in the legal profession. My track record and commitment to the Bar Association speaks for itself. If elected to the Board of Governors, I will continue to work tirelessly toward the organization's goals and missions and to be a model representative for the organization throughout the community. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. Next, let's hear from Nan Sato. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nan Sato. I am an attorney with the law firm Fisher Phillips, specializing in international employment law. I started my career as a corporate M&A lawyer uh, and then transitioned into sports and entertainment law with a Tokyo-based law firm. Um, a little bit about me personally, I'm half Japanese, half Chinese, grew up in both countries and also uh, lived in Spain a little bit during college. Um, I came to the U.S. about 15 years ago, uh, thinking that I would be here for six months to a year, and 15 years later, I'm still here. Uh, Philadelphia is my adopted home. So as somebody who has lived and worked extensively in different countries, I bring a unique perspective to the Bar Association. Uh, if elected, I have a three-point plan. One is to raise the awareness of the Bar Association among local business groups and minority organizations. I'm involved actively in a number of these organizations and some on the board level. And two is to increase the membership and participation among attorneys from diverse backgrounds and affinity bar associations. Um, being somebody who grew up in uh, the international school system with people from uh, different nationalities, uh, I'm a beneficiary of diversity and a strong believer that diversity builds the best organizations. And lastly, I would like to enhance the bar association's name recognition globally by building collaborative relationships with international bar associations using the professional and personal relationships I built throughout the years. Thank you very much. I hope to get your support. Thank you, Nan. And now finally, uh, last but not least, Arlie Smith Pearson. Good afternoon, my name is Arlie Smith Pearson. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I work at Philadelphia Legal Assistance. I am a staff attorney and I represent survivors of interpersonal violence in their family law matters. 
I'm also a full-time Drexel professor teaching the civil litigation field clinic. Um, I have been actively involved with the Bar Association for many years and have held several leadership positions. I began in the YLD um, as a liaison. I was elected to the uh, executive committee of the YLD and served as the financial secretary. I am active in the family law section um, and have held numerous positions in the public interest section. I was an executive committee member, vice chair, and I was the 2020 chair, currently the immediate past chair. I also co-founded the associates committee uh, of the public interest section, which I still chair. For the last two years, I have been a appointed member of the Board of Governors as the public interest section representative, and I have won three consecutive bar stars. So I am very active in the work of the sections um, and believe deeply in the professional development and legal education that the, second, uh, the sections do. But I hope to have a seat on the Board of Governors to really contribute to the policy work um, that the Board of Governors and the Bar Association does uh, to advance access to justice initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Arlie. At this time, we will now shift to a question and answer session uh, for the Board of Governors candidates. Each question will be uh, given, uh, the, the, each candidate will, that is, will be given 30 seconds to answer the question. Not all candidates will get the same question. The first question is a question that I'm going to be addressing to both Will Braveman, Bethany Nikotenko, Stephen Culp, and Nan Sato. So starting with Will Braveman, what can the association do to increase the number of diverse young lawyers being hired by law firms in Philadelphia? Thanks, Judge. I think that's a great question. I think the number one thing that needs to be done is there need to be programs in law schools that subsidize summer internships to give people of diverse backgrounds experience and intros to law firms. Because once people meet people in law firms in the context of a summer job, they tend to stay there. And I think that that's the key, getting them in young in law schools. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Same question, Bethany. The legal profession remains one of the least diverse of any professions. Part of the problem is a lack of consensus that there is a significant problem. We need to stop confusing our efforts with results. We cannot just be checking off boxes. Perhaps we should be focusing our efforts on the bottom and the top. We should work to increase diversity in law schools and strive to solve the disproportionate attrition rates in law firms. It's a complex problem with no simple answers. Thank you, Bethany. Stephen, you next, please. Yeah, I think one of the, to echo what uh, the other candidates have said, I do think there is a problem that is one that is pervasive not only in our community here in Philadelphia, but across the country. Um, I believe that we need to be committing to our students at a young age to demonstrate why the firms are the place that they wanna be and why they will be accepted there. I think that takes a lot of compassion. I, take that, I think that takes a lot of difficult conversations and that is something that I can bring to the Board of Governors when I speak with firms and explain not only my own experience as a diverse lawyer, but also ways in which you can support diversity within your firm to have committed attorneys who will stay there because of the, the support that they receive from the partners and everyone at the firm. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. And now, uh, Nan. I think there are two points. One is outreach programs, and the other one is mentorship. So uh, we need to have more outreach programs to diverse lawyers who are already practicing. I think there, there's a sizable group of diverse lawyers um, in firms and in-house and government entities, but they're not necessarily active in the Bar Association. So we need to reach out to them to help them see the benefits. And two is mentorship for young diverse attorneys to uh, help them understand what the Bar Association is about, what activities we do, and uh, help them become better lawyers at the same time. 
Thank you, Nan. The next question, and this question will be for Ernie Holzheimer, for Michael Huff, and for Arlie Smith Pearson. And the question is, in what ways could the association act to strengthen its influence in the state legislature? And this time I'm going to start with Arlie. I think that we have a good foothold in the legislature with our lobbyist, Tony Creasy. Um, and I think the best way that we could uh, work uh, is to uh, maybe have another lobbyist hired if we can work those finances out. Um, but our, I believe that the association's policy positions matter. And you can see that uh, things that we say as a bar association do affect policy in Harrisburg. Thank you so much, Arlie. Uh, and next, please, uh, Mike. Mike uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, Judge, um, I also volunteer with an organization called March on Harrisburg. I have personally lobbied um, senators and uh, representatives in Harrisburg for issues such as getting money out of politics. Um, I don't see any reason why the Bar Association and its members can't do the same thing, uh, to go to uh, legislators' offices in Harrisburg, as well as their local offices, uh, let them know that we are a force to be reckoned reckon with and that our voices were, will be heard. Thank you, Mike. And finally, uh, Ernie, please. Thank you, Judge. I agree with the, the um, other candidates here as well. Obviously, we can uh, take strong stances on, on certain matters. And, and we have in the past, in this past year, we've passed several resolutions encouraging um, various political bodies to um, follow a, a certain path forward, um, you know, one of which is the um, access to eviction records for tenants who have um, had the matter dismissed or the matter resolved in their favor. Um, you know, we can continue to make such efforts. We can continue to make lobbying efforts um, in the legislature as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ernie. The next question is a question that I will address to Nan, to Steve, to Bethany, and to Will. The question is, advocacy on behalf of the public has long been a priority for the association. What new area of advocacy on behalf of the public do you believe that the association should undertake? And in this case, let's start uh, with Nan, please. Yes, I, I believe the uh, most important area, both from my personal experience and the experience of attorneys that I've spoken to, is really the um, you know underrepresented minority groups. Uh, so in the last year, you've seen violence against certain minority groups. Uh, and uh, uh, there, there have been scattered efforts from different organizations to help uh, raise their voices. But I think that's far from enough. I think the Bar Association has a lot of uh, authority and expertise in those areas. And we can definitely stand up more for those groups. Thank you, Nan. And next, I'd like to hear, please, if I may, uh, from uh, Stephen. Thanks, Judge. Yeah, I, as someone who represents uh, a lot of voices in terms of in the LGBTQ community and adoptee community and the API community, advocacy is another full-time job that I have. And I shouldn't even call it a job. It's something I committed to. It's something that I'm passionate about. I think reaching out to the community members um, that are marginalized and are, do face discrimination and implicit bias and uh, um, challenges and hurdles that are both systemic and implicit, that is a great place to be an advocate and to serve the community because it empowers people to um, take the next step, have conversations and become better advocates themselves. Thank you, Steve. And then finally, uh, if I may, Will, please. Thanks, Judge. Such a great question. And my idea is a task force on discrimination. You've heard me speak about it before. Uh, I want to touch on three components of that. The short term, let's set up the equivalent of a legal line just for discrimination, staff it ourselves, and take calls once a month, once every other month. Medium term, let's get the agencies at the table, the EEOC, the PHRC, the Philadelphia Commission, they're past attorneys like myself and they're present attorneys. And let's talk about why is it that people are being denied access to justice? And thirdly, and this is a huge one, 
let's amend the Philadelphia Fair Practices Ordinance. I was at a councilman's office yesterday. He is on board. There is a second one I know is also on board. We can do you, amend the Fair Practices Ordinance to get a jury trial for discrimination matters in state court. Thank you. Thank you. And Bethany, I apologize, certainly uh, not least in any way. No problem. Thank you, Your Honor. Free representation for civil defendants should continue to be a priority of the Philadelphia Bar Association. Far too many Philadelphians are economically railroaded for the remainder of their life because they do not receive representation in collections matters and tort claims. Civil Gideon should continue to be a top priority of the Philadelphia Bar Association. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. The next question will go to Ernie Holzheimer, to Michael Hoffman, to Arlie Smith Pearson. The question is as follows. What would you do to increase our engagement with our membership? And let's this time start with Mike. Um, so, you know, I think uh, obviously I'm a, I've been a criminal defense lawyer for a lot of years. And when I was getting my signatures uh, to be on the ballot uh, for this run of Board of Governors, I went throughout the Criminal Justice Center. And I spoke with a lot of criminal lawyers, uh, defense attorneys, um, public defenders uh, and district attorneys, and a, a lot of whom, you know, were not involved in the Philadelphia Bar Association, much to my surprise. So I think not only do I want to encourage engagement with the Philadelphia Bar Association, but to also encourage uh, that these people join the Bar Association. And just, I, I just don't think that they understand all of the great uh, benefits and resources that the Bar Association has. And so I think there's really gotta be uh, an educational aspect to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next, Ernie, please. Thank you. I think um, you know the best way to engage with members is to encourage for them to be engaged. I think we've done a great job in the past several months of transitioning back to in-person events, and I've loved seeing a lot of the folks on this call at in-person events. Um, I also think it would be great to further encourage our membership to take on speaking roles at various CLEs, plan CLEs, um, write for the bar reporter, um, really get out there because I think the best, again, the best way to have folks be engaged with the member with the um, association is for them to take on such roles and it be really involved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and at this point, then let's see. I would now like to call upon Arlie, please. Thank you. I think that the best way to get people involved is to call them in. Uh, is to identify individuals and invite them to participate. Everybody on this call knows that the Bar Association has amazing benefits for every practitioner, and it's really making people feel welcome. And I believe I have a track record of this. Two of the Bar Star Awards that I won were for largest growth of uh, the Associates Committee and the public intersection when I chaired them. And so it has worked in the past. Thank you, Orly. Uh, the next question is a question that I am going to be directing to Arlie, to Mike, and to Ernie. Uh, and I remind everybody, let's try and keep within time limits. Uh, the association needs to be a strong partner in enhancing the life and well-being of the city. How would you go about increasing the role that the association has in the important decisions affecting the citizenry of Philadelphia? Arlie, let's start with you. I think that the Bar Association should address the hard issues that it does uh, on a consistent basis. The resolutions that the Board of Governors puts forward on issues affecting uh, those living in poverty in Philadelphia make a difference. The Philadelphia Bar Association has really led the charge in things like civil Gideon for tenants, and that is keeping people in their homes especially during a pandemic, and we should continue to address those issues. Thank you, Arlie. Ernie, the same question for you, please. Thank you. As mentioned earlier, and as Arlie uh, alluded to, the, the Bar Association has passed several resolutions that encourage um, you know, certain aspects of that, that touch on citizens' lives, including landlord-tenant issues. We also have in various sections and divisions engagement with Philadelphia citizens through um, 
the Young Lawyers Law Week program where we get out to the local libraries and engage with citizens to help address legal issues. Uh, we partner with Philly VIP in the business law section to address issues for small businesses and nonprofits in the city of Philadelphia. And we look forward to continuing those programs in the future. Thank you, Ernie. And finally, Mike, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Judge, in order for the association to be in partnership with the city, we have to show the city, uh, obviously, that we care. I really enjoyed um, volunteering a few weeks ago um, with Tracy Gordon cleaning up uh, the local parks. Um, and so I think we need to show the city that we care about the citizens, that we are a part of this city, and we need to lobby city council people and, again, let them know uh, that we have a voice and that, um, you know, we have opinions with regard to landlord-tenant, as you've already heard, as well as the homeless, um, you know, population that we have in Philadelphia is just one of the one of the worst in the country is, and the opioid epidemic that's going on. You know, there's just so many problems that this city has, and I think the Bar Association could be a great partnership with the leadership to solve those problems. Thank you, Mike. And Thank now you. at this point, I have one final question that I will be addressing to Nan, to Steve, to Bethany, and Will. And because of this, please try and keep your answers within the time limits. And the question is, what one change in the association do you believe is essential for continued success? And let's start with Bethany, please. I think we need to continue to recruit members to the YLD because they are the future of the organization. And I think we should focus on expanding program to the YLD and developing more mentorship and professional de uh, development programs. And I believe that this will lead to a bigger and more improved bar association. I think the young people should be the focus. They are the leaders of the organization. And if we improve the programming and the quality of the YLD, we will in turn improve the quality of the bar association. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. Um, will you next, please? Same question. Thanks, Judge. Uh, I totally agree with Bethany. I think recruitment is critical. Recruiting young is critical. I also think that recruiting solo practitioners of all ages is critical. The membership was decimated during COVID. It's millions of dollars that are out of our coffers. I believe people join the Bar Association, um, uh, uh, many of them to network, and we need to show them by having more in-person events that that's back. And I think people will flock back to the Bar Association if we do that. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Will. Nan, you next, please. I believe we need to rekindle and enhance the relationships with large law firms. I know that the Bar Association had a lot of large law firm members um, before, but that number has been dropping over the years. And uh, you know, my firm is doing a great job by signing up everybody and paying everybody's fees. I know that Colson O'Connor is doing that, but a lot of firms are no longer doing that. So I think if we can um, you know, rebuild those relationships, we can really pick up a critical group of lawyers and get them more actively involved. Thank you, Nan. And finally, Steve. I would say more support for the Affinity Bar Associations of Philadelphia. Uh, mm -hmm. We represent some amazing attorneys as Affinity Bars and the Philadelphia Bar Association is, goes hand in hand with the work that we strive to do. Um, I think that finding mutual benefits between the Philadelphia Bar Association and Affinities is a great place to start, um, including uh, looking at how membership is, is structured. Um, it's expensive to be part of so many bar associations, and I believe that there's something to be done where Affinity Bars and the Philadelphia Bar Association can come together as one. Thank you, Steve. And at this point in time, I believe that we have concluded the questioning period for the candidates for the Board of Governors. I'd like to thank each of you for uh, the time and effort that you've put into providing these answers. Uh, at this point in time, you can turn off your cameras and your microphones. We will next be going to the candidates for Vice Chancellor. And at this point in time, uh, Kathy Jafari and Jen Coatsworth, if you will please turn on your cameras, but keep your microphone off until I introduce you. Thank you very much. So as we now proceed forward, 
each of the candidates for vice chancellor will be allowed to have five minutes uh, to introduce themselves, to address their positions. Those candidates will be called on in alphabetical order. Following that time, we will have a question and answer session for the candidates for vice chancellor. That will be a 20 minute question and answer session. During that period of time, each candidate uh, will be given uh, two minutes to be able to answer the particular question. Following that, we will have a time for each candidate in alphabetical order to be allowed to have one and a half uh, minutes to be able to sum up. Thank you. So at this point, I am going to direct my first uh, introduction then to Jen Coatsworth. Jen, if you would, please. Thank you, Judge Snyder. Good afternoon. I want to thank the Bar Association for taking the time to conduct this forum and hear from the candidates. Allow me to introduce myself, to those who I may not already know. My name is Jen Coatsworth, and I'm a partner at Margolis Edelstein, where I've worked for nearly 18 years. I'm a lifelong Philadelphian, and I currently live outside the city in South Jersey with my husband and two young sons. I grew up in a family where diversity was a core value taught to me at a very young age. As the daughter of a gay father, I learned quickly the ugliness of bigotry and prejudice. The pain I endured as a child from closed-minded neighbors and friends stayed with me to adulthood. I first became involved in the Bar Association over 15 years ago in order to participate in activities that I thought would contribute to the greater good of the profession and, our, and to our community at large. In particular, I was exploring ways that I could have an impact on advancing diversity initiatives to eliminate bias and prejudice within our legal community and beyond. I started my bar service in the YLD Executive Committee for approximately five years, including winning terms as secretary and vice chair. When my three-year term was over, I continued as a liaison for two additional years. I then ran for and won a three-year term on the Board of Governors. I was appointed by at Chancellor Al Dandridge in 2015 to serve at the cabinet level position of parliamentarian, and I have served in the cabinet since that time, including three years as assistant secretary, two years as secretary, and I'm currently serving as assistant treasurer. Over the course of my bar career, I've also co-chaired several committees, including the Women in the Profession, Bench Bar, and the Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. And I'm currently co-chairing the Bar-Wide Mentorship and Professional Development Initiative, in which we've made 40 matches so far and co-hosted a successful relaunch party with the YLD. I've been an active member of a number of other sections and committees, including the State Civil Litigation Section, the Real Property Section, the Women's Rights Committee, and the Public Interest Section. I've also served on important committees of the association, such as the Elections and Budget and Finance Committees. As I prepared for our election forums, I reflected on my time leading and serving our Bar Association and its members. I started counting the hours I, I've contributed, working on Bar Association initiatives, and realized that I have devoted more than 3,000 hours to working solely for our association. This is in addition to my contributions working on many other leadership roles in the professional community. I recall that during my 10 years serving on the Board of Governors, I've participated in more than 100 board meetings, addressing issues that range from supporting the mortgage diversion program to youth courts, to enacting the association's diversity inclusion action plan, to crowdfunding the Securities Exchange Commission, to marriage equality, to climate change, to equal pay laws, to expungements and pardons, to immigration, to criminal sentencing, to funding the judiciary, to custody and parental rights, and of course, issues facing the lawyers and the community related to the COVID-19 pandemic, just to name a few. Additionally, I've witnessed the leadership of 10 different chancellors while serving on the board and in the cabinet. Through this experience, I've learned what has worked and what has not, and I've gained valuable insight as to every aspect of our association. I've worked on issues related to just about every section and committee of the association. In addition to my service within our Bar Association, I've been very active with the State Bar. In particular, I currently serve as the Zone 1 Governor, representing Philadelphia lawyers and our Bar Association in the governing bodies of the PBA. I've chaired sections and committees in the State Bar, including the Women in the Profession and Civil Litigation Section, and I'm a member of a number of other committees and sections in the State Bar. Additionally, I've led the Brandeis Law Society as its chancellor, and I've been an active member of the executive committees of the Philadelphia Association of Defense Council and Temple Law Alumni Association for a number of years. 
Additionally, I've served on the advisory board of Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts and the Community Legal Services Leadership Council for several years. Through my leadership roles in various committees and sections of the PBA and other legal organizations in the city, I have forged strong relationships with leaders across the state that have always served to the benefit of our association and our members. They have contributed to our ability to move forward statewide initiatives. For instance, we were able to harness relationships across the state to advance rule of professional conduct 8.4G, which makes it an ethical violation to harass or discriminate on the basis of a number of protected classes. I also worked closely with several organizations to leverage relationships formed over many years in lobbying efforts to defeat the horrific judicial gerrymandering efforts across the state. I have some concrete ideas about how we can increase our membership, expand member benefits, and move forward to further advance the core values of our association, including commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, serving the underprivileged, and maintaining judicial independence and adherence to the rule of law. And I look forward to sharing those with you today. Thank you, Jen. Next, Kathy Chafari. Thank you so much, Judge Snyder, and thank you so much to the Bar Association for hosting this forum. I'm so excited that we have this opportunity to speak with all of the members in attendance. As mentioned, my name is Kathy Jaffari, and I'm running for Vice Chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar Association because I have the experience, the vision, and passion to devote myself in service to an organization from which I have gained so much. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a first-generation American and lawyer. As immigrants, my parents believed that being in the U.S. was a privilege, and with that privilege came a duty, and that duty was service to one's community and society, and that's why I'm running for vice chancellor. My community is Philadelphia. I have lived and worked in Philadelphia my entire life, except for a short stint to D.C. for law school, but as we all know, we all come back to Philly. I'm a proud graduate of the Philadelphia public school system. Usually that means we ask each other what high school we went to. I went to Washington and being exposed to Temple University at Washington High School is where I actually got the excitement to go to Temple where I received my bachelor's and my MBA. And I also am currently an adjunct professor for the last 20 years in the legal studies department of the Fox School of Business. I went to law school in, at GW in DC and during law school, I interned with Chief Judge Sloviter of the Third Circuit. I knew I wanted to be a business lawyer, but I knew it was important to understand how our court system worked. And even though everybody said you don't need a clerkship, I thought it was important to do so. And so I had the privilege of clerking with Judge Tidwell of the Court of Federal Claims. After my clerkship, I joined Saul Ewing. It was a wonderful place to grow up and become a partner, at which point I was recruited to Ballard Spar that gave me a platform to grow my practice. And from there, I was recruited to join Cozen O'Connor as chair of the Corporate Governance and Securities Practice Group. I have a track record of listening and building. As a team, we surpassed our 18-month strategic plan in 10 months. Yes, that's during COVID. And it's through all of my professional experiences at these incredible firms that I've been able to devote myself to the Bar Association. The Bar Association is ingrained in my DNA and it's time for me to give back. I have five pillars of commitment that I'm making to the Bar Association. First and foremost, to your professional development. Whatever that looks like, whether you're at a law firm, in your solo practice, as a government lawyer, as a judge, or a public interest lawyer. I spent my bar years devoted to many different committees throughout the organization, as well as the business law section from which I have their endorsement. I created structure and foundation and programming that continues today. I believe the bar provides incredible resources for your practice development. And I wanna know exactly what you need and how you can get it. On the back end of my five pillars is wellness. Our jobs are extremely difficult. And as we manage our career, we are parents and caretakers. 15 years ago, I brought yoga to my firm. Everybody thought I was nuts, but when I commit, people support. As chair of the business law section, with the help of Tara Phoenix and a committed committee, I brought mindfulness series to the, uh, to the Bar Association. 
Using these series, I was able to convince the Bar Association to create a wellness committee. And as a result, I launched the wellness committee many years ago at the Bar Association, and I'm so excited to see its incredible success. One of our most important functions at the Bar Association is our commitment to access to justice and the protection of the courts and judges. As a judicial clerk, clerk I know what that means. As a resident of Philadelphia, I know how it feels to take my Philly bar list of judges into the voting booth, having volunteered to pass them out. I want to be sure that all lawyers and Philadelphia knows the great work we are doing. And I want us to continue to be the voice loud and clear when that voice needs to be heard for those who don't have the voice. This goes hand in hand with a commitment to public interest. I want to be sure that you have the support you need to do public interest work. I've devoted myself to pro bono throughout my entire career, from being a young lawyer to doing so as a partner, volunteering as an advocate for children, immigrants, and communities in needs, including serving in countless roles at the Support Center for Child Advocates, culminating in its presidency. I've traveled to the U.S. border to represent immigrants held in detention centers, to volunteering in hundreds of VIP programs, including Legal Line and the Business Clinics. I can provide what you need in terms of avenues to do your pro bono work. I'm proud to say as an associate, I was able to champion pro bono credit at one of, one of my firms. And I'm proud to see firms are now considering DEI credit as well. And that leads to my fifth pillar, DEI. I've spent hundreds of thousands of hours working in the DEI space, championing the cause, educating, Kathy. sharing, and helping to solve problems. Kathy, thank you. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. So sorry. I didn't realize I went over. All I want to say right. is I look forward to sharing more about the work I've done. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And now we'll switch to a question and answer session. Um, the first question that I have, and I'm going to ask this question of both candidates. What do you believe is the greatest challenge for the Philadelphia Bar Association? And how would you go about meeting that challenge? I'll begin with Jen Coatsworth. Thank you. So like all organizations, I think the greatest, the greatest challenge we face at this time is membership, ensuring the engagement of our members and attracting new members to our association. And one of the ideas that I've had for a number of years uh, with regard to increasing membership includes making our association more attractive and affordable to members of the affinity communities. So since I was vice chancellor of the Brandeis Law Society about six years ago, I've talked about the idea of having a menu option for our affinity bar association members so that you can join the Philadelphia Bar Association and any number of other organizations and get a discount for doing so. The more organizations you join, the steeper the discount. So that's one idea to bring new members into the community. I think it also helps with engagement because it allows us to experience a number of different cultures and really um, be able to connect with all of the different aspects of our legal community. I have other ideas regarding bringing in young lawyers that I hope that we get the chance to discuss later, including a secondment fair, which I think will help attract um, in-house counsels to our association. I think we have, our association is, is rather deficient in in-house counsels and staff counsels. And I think by hosting events that appeals directly to them will appeal not only to the in-house counsels, but also to large firm members who seek to have those in-house counsels as our clients. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Kathy, the same question for you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, th this is what's so wonderful about a program like this and having an election between two people because I completely agree with Jen. Membership is key and engagement is key. And, you know, as Jen was talking about thinking about, you know, the affinity associations, I completely agree. And I want to expand that. The idea with respect to membership and engagement and how to grow that is really, in my mind, a conversation of collaborations. And we really need to grow collaborations. The more collaborations we have, 
the more engagement we have. And what do I mean by collaborations? The Bar Associations has thousands of members, and we'll talk a little bit more, I'm sure, I hope about engagement, but thousands of members who are not engaged. Yet, there are thousands of members of ACC, the Association of Corporate Counsel, and that when we think about in-house counsel, how can we collaborate with the ACC? How can we collaborate with the affinity bars? How can we collaborate with the individual law firms, whether they be large law firms, whether they be solo practitioners? How do we collaborate with the government? Government. When I say collaborate, I mean when we are putting on our programs, let's put them on together. When we are coming up with our resolutions, let's reach out. I have a track record of bringing many different voices to a table. And I think the Bar Association has done this, can continue to do this, and I am committed to bringing all of my associations and connections I have to the Bar Association to grow that collaboration for the pursuit of membership and engagement. Thank you, Kathy. So the next question, and it is again gonna be for both Kathy and Jen, and this time I will start with Kathy. Philadelphia has the unenviable record of being one of the poorest large cities in the nation. How could the Bar Association act to improve the economic health and makeup of the city? Kathy? Your Honor, what an incredible, uh, credible question. And I say that as a resident of Philadelphia, I say that as I watched what the city went through um, during the pandemic. And I say that as I watched what the city went through during the, the, the justified cries against racial injustice. And poverty and, and the fight against poverty can, uh, can be uh, attacked in numerous ways, one of which is education. The Philadelphia Bar Association is a respected organization and its members are made up of respected individuals. It is our duty to reach out into the city and support the education of those in Philadelphia. We do that through our civics program in which I volunteered in the past. We do that when we are educating in trying to get the best judges possible through the, the Judicial Selection Committee. And we can do that with respect to our resolutions and our voice when something is happening in this city that we need to call out. We need to collaborate with the mayor's office and city council with respect to ways in which we can support the economy of Philadelphia. Rather than be one voice, let's join in with others so that we can be a collective voice in fighting poverty and in fight and creating an economic balance in this city. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Kathy. Jen, the same question for you, please. Thank you, Judge Snyder. We have an amazing network of nonprofit organizations within our legal community. And I think we need to harness the resources of the talented people who work within those organizations to be able to work with the Board of Governors and the leadership of the association to bring resolutions before our board so that we can encourage city council and the mayor, as well as the state legislature to continue to move forward with initiatives that support our city's citizens. Um, we have worked to and been leaders on the mortgage foreclosure diversion program. We've also, I was involved um, when I was the uh, co-chair of the Women in the Profession Committee with the uh, Equal Pay Act. And I think it's important to ensure that all the citizens are in our city are being compensated fairly. And I think that's one other way that we can support the economic welfare of our city. We worked with the city of Philadelphia on the litigation in which they were involved to advance the Equal Pay Act when it was faced with challenges. And we can, we can and should continue to work with our legislators both in the city and across the state in order to do that. I have the resources to be able to do that based upon the relationships that I've built through the years uh, over the course of my work in both our association as well as many statewide organizations in which I serve leadership roles. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. The next question is, and again, I'm going to ask it of both candidates. Uh, 
In what way do you believe that the Bar Association has not done all that it could do for the legal community? And what would you do to remedy the situation? And I'm gonna start with Jen this time. Thank you. So I think we have an amazing association. It's one of the reasons that I'm running to be able to be its, it's the head of the association. However, there are always things that every organization can do better. I think one of the things that we can do is to provide a better membership benefit by way of information to our members. The, we can increase the communications that our sections and committees have with its members by offering greater, more robust listservs, newsletters, and other resources that provide our members valuable assets of knowledge and information and collaboration, the ability to ask questions of fellow members and to seek information um, that will improve their practices. So that's one area that I think we can improve. As I mentioned earlier, I think we are also very deficient in corporate councils, which I think is leading to a, a downturn in membership from our large firm members. And I think if we can continue to seek ways to attract corporate councils to our association by doing things such as planning chancellor's forums that are devoted specifically to issues that relate to in-house councils, we will then attract the in-house councils to our association, which will then attract young lawyers and large firm members who will be seeking their um, face time with their potential clients. Those are just some of the ideas that I have about how we can address the deficiencies of the association, which I think are few. Thank you very much, Jen. Kathy, the same question, please. Thank you, Judge Snyder. Look, I agree, the association is an incredible association. And, and hence why we are here today and having this forum and why we're devoting our time to this forum. In terms of what we could do more or what we could do better or what we could do that could provide better opportunities for our members, it really is engagement. We had this incredible, incredible, uh, beautiful event last night for member appreciation um, that Tracy did a yeoman's job and everyone on the staff did a yeoman's job in putting off on. And it was incredible. It was beautiful. We have thousands of members of the organization, and we had a couple of hundred there last night. And it's a shame they didn't get to see the incredible work and the incredible joy we had together. So it's engagement. What can we do to have greater engagement of the current members, as well as growing the membership? Um, you know, we have the track record at the business law section, including when I was chair of the business law section, when we actually did grow the membership of in-house counsel. Uh, as president of the Support Center for Child Advocates, one of my roles was actually to grow corporate individuals joining the board of directors of that organization. So my ties to the corporations and the corporate practices are far wide and I can bring them into the fold of the Bar Association. But engagement is more than just increasing communication. Engagement is how do we communicate in a way that our members want that communication. I've spoken to friends who have said, oh, we saw the announcement, but we didn't quite know what was happening today or yesterday or last week. So working with the incredible staff on what the engagement needs to look like based on what our members want it to look like will and can and should be the key. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. The next question is, is one which is uh, spurred by the fact that in the laudable effort and necessary effort of increasing diversity and equity and inclusion uh, in the profession. One of the most significant issues is how do we increase the number of diverse young lawyers being hired by law firms in Philadelphia? And that's my question now, and I'm gonna start with Kathy for that. Incredibly important question, and I have specific tools on how to do that. I have had the experience of working hand in hand with chief diversity officers of the law firms around this, around this city. And I will tell you, it stems from our individual work as leaders in our organizations. 
We must sit at the table and make sure diverse lawyers are not only interviewed, but hired. And I have done that. I have sat at the table and made sure that those interviews happened and the hiring happened and continued. It's not just hiring diverse lawyers. It's DEI. It's inclusivity. Making sure that diverse lawyers are included in all of the projects, whether I have an IPO going on or I have a project going on that has to do with a significant transaction, I make sure my entire team is diverse. That's the inclusion part. We also need to make sure that we are giving credit where credit is due. In other words, credit comes in the form of compensation. We need to make sure that our diverse lawyers are getting the same exact sponsorship, not just mentorship, but sponsorship. Someone sitting at the table saying that individual absolutely deserves not only the promotion, but the compensation that comes with it. I have actually given credit to my colleagues. I've been told by other colleagues, what am I doing? And what I'm doing is I'm thinking of the future of the practice of law and the legacy of all that we have done as lawyers. I have so many other ideas, but I know I'm running out of time. <laughs> so I want to be cognizant of my time, but much that we can do, but it needs to be actual work, not just words. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Kathy. Jen, the same question for you. Thank you, Judge Snyder. So I agree with Kathy that we need to make sure that within our organizations, we are promoting, advancing DEI efforts. Absolutely. But I really think that it needs to start earlier. It needs to start at a young age. We need to show young, diverse boys and girls at a school age that they have the ability and the, the right and, and every effort should be made to expose young children to the legal community to show that they're the positive impact that we can have. So I have some specific ideas on how we can do that. Specifically years ago, there was a law explorers outpost where um, young children, young boys, I believe from the Boy Scouts primarily, um, were given access to our, um, to our uh, law firms across the city to be able to observe what it is to be a lawyer. I think we need to expand that. I think we need to go into the community organizations across the city, the Boys and Girls Clubs, and to expand and to bring back the Law Explorers Outpost to show young diverse children that they can and should look to become lawyers. I also think that we should have um, a diversity summit. And that is one thing that I'm committed to doing at, within the first few weeks of my chancellorship because I think that it is a prime, it is one of the primary aspects that we should be working on. I'd like to be able to bring in national speakers to the summit, but also to have roundtable discussions and breakout se sessions where we can discuss concrete ideas that we can work to implement throughout the remainder of the year. And finally, as I previously mentioned, I think that the idea of a secondment fair is going to be really beneficial to young diverse associates because giving them access to the corporate counsels who are their firm's clients will help assure them partnership and makes them more attractive partners within their organization. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And, and now, again, I will ask this question of both of you. I'll start with Jen. What one change in the association do you believe is essential for continued success? Well, I think that we've already discussed a lot of what we need to do. And we do need to work on collaborations and, and working with the, our brother and sister organizations across, the, across our legal community. Um, Right now, I'm working with some other folks um, who are in leadership positions to create a program, a CLE program, with the Philadelphia Association of Defense Counsel, the LGBTQ plus lawyers of Philadelphia, and the LGBTQ rights committee of our bar association to create a CLE program that would um, allow our members to talk about some of the issues that we're talking about today, how we can really roll up our sleeves and look, about, look at why and how diversity is important in our profession. 
So that's one idea that I think we could do is just really increase collaborations among our, our various legal organizations in the city. I think we do that to some extent, but I think we really need to continue to do that and CLEs and other events um, that we can collaborate on is just one way to do it. Another example of where we've done that is I think we can do that not only with regard to CLEs, but I think we also can collaborate across or all organizations on fun or on fun events like the membership event that we had last night, which I too commend the bar staff and particularly Tracy. It was a fabulous event and it was really a great way to showcase our association. But I think we need to have more events like that and include the affinity bar event, uh, bar associations with events such as the one I planned where we had an all affinity bar association food tasting, allowing each other to taste each other's cultures so we could really experience and understand each other. So I think in some, one of the things that we really could do better is better collaboration with our brother and sister organizations, both within our city and across the state. Thank you, Jen. Kathy? Thank you, Judge Snyder. This is a hard one because I agree with Jen, right? I think, look, I think the organization is an incredible organization and the key is to making sure that our current members know that and have access to what all of the great things that we do, including the great program, in programming, including the great um, events that we have. But if I were to say there is one thing that maybe we could do better, I think there's tremendous work that is done within each of the individual sections, as well as committees. I think we, the, we have incredible resolutions that come out of the individual sections and committees. I think there's incredible programming that comes out of the sections and the committees. And, and I, I, I think that is great. But I think when we think at the bar level, the bar association level, how do we bring all of that great work together so that, for example, when we have an event for the bar association, we make sure that we have everyone come to that event. And so, you know, I've used the word collaboration before. I have specific examples of how I've demonstrated and created collaborative um, programming that actually um, stands the test of time. So, for example, at the American Bar Association, I actually launched the Diversity in the Boardroom Task Force, as well as the ESG Task Force. And I brought a number of different ABA committees to that task force, both of them. It is by having representatives from each of these individual organizations fully committed to creating a product program or conversation that we actually have greater engagement. And I think with greater engagement, more of our members and new members can really get the benefit of everything that our association has to offer. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And at this point, this concludes the question and answer portion of the vice chancellor candidates. I'm now going to allow each of the candidates one minute, and I apologize for initially saying one and a half minutes uh, to sum up. We'll do this in alphabetical order. Jen Coates, with you first, please. Thank you, Judge Snyder. And thank you for the opportunity to discuss my experience, the reasons that I'm running in my vision for our association moving forward. Through my work, I've earned the respect and support of our peers, including endorsements by some of the key stakeholders in our legal community, including APABA PA, the Brandeis Law Society, the Justinian Law Society of Philadelphia, Philadelphia Association of Defense Council, the Bar Association State Civil Litigation Section, and the Philadelphia Trial Lawyers Association. I've logged an incredible amount of time, energy, dedication, and sweat equity into our Bar Association. I have the depth and breadth of understanding and experience, talent as a leader and ability to forge consensus to move our association on the right path into the future. When you look at my resume, I have unmatched experience and vision and concrete ideas to lead our association forward. If I'm privileged to serve as the association's 97th chancellor, I will continue to uphold the proud ideals upon which the association was built and continue to move forward so that we can reach even greater heights. And I humbly ask for your support. 
Thank you, Jen. Kathy? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you so much for this forum and the thoughtful questions. The association has reacted quickly to focus on many acute challenges in our profession, from the effects of the pandemic to an access to justice to the critical needs to address systematic racism and the justified call for racial justice and equity. I don't just sit on committees or groups or boards, I do the work. I am in action for all of which I can list off countless programs and initiatives that I've created, started, and continue well beyond me, both at the Bar Association as well as throughout this city. I sat at the Finance and Budget Committee tables at the Bar Association at its most critical times, and I helped write the ship. Throughout my endeavors, I've demonstrated my ability to listen, engage, and empower others to create build and support initiatives and to champion the voices of others. I have the depth of experience both at the Bar Association as well as through this city on countless boards of directors. As a corporate governance lawyer and business advisor, I have the experience to further the mission of the association and advocate for all of its members. It would be an honor and a privilege to have the opportunity to represent the voices of the members and support the advancements in our professions. I welcome your thoughts as we build a dynamic association built on diversity of voices and a call to action. I humbly ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, this concludes the official program for the Candidates Forum. You've had an opportunity today to hear from candidates for the Board of Governors and for Vice Chancellor. You've had an opportunity to have those who are uncontested in their offices introduce themselves. I think that if you listen to the questions and answers, you heard a great deal of thought and creativity uh, on the part of each of the candidates. I, as a former chancellor, am very excited, excited and heartened by the fact that we have so many people that have put so much thought and so much effort into being able to run and being active in the association. I'd like to remind everybody that online voting begins on November 22nd and will conclude with the annual meeting on December 13th. Please keep in mind what you have heard today. Please remember to make sure that you vote. I also want to thank the staff of the association, in particular, Tracy McCloskey and Rachel Kipp for their efforts in putting this program together and in making sure that things stay on time. Uh, I want to thank each one of you today for taking time from your day to be able to listen to the candidates. I think that they represent an exciting group of people and that they represent a wonderful future for the association. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day and a good remainder of the week.